Thank you all for being here and thank you to uh, PAM, the Malaysian Institute of Architects, for hosting me here in Kuala Lumpur. It's my first time in Kuala Lumpur, but not the first in uh, Malaysia. We've been here before for a workshop in Penang, actually. Uh, but it was great to see the city before starting this talk and sort of finding a common ground between what I'm going to be talking to you here uh, about today and uh, the state of architecture, the current state of architecture in Kuala Lumpur. So if we can start the presentation. So before we start, maybe uh, I'd like to get to know the audience a little bit more so that I can fine tune what I'm going to be saying here. How many of the people joining us here today are practitioners? Can you please raise a, uh, show, 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 your, show your hands if you're a, a practitioner? working in an office. How many of you are entrepreneurs? You own your own business or an office? Okay. And how many are students? Okay, not a lot of students. I, I expected more actually. Um, the reason why I'm asking this is because, you know, the work that I'm going to be showing is obviously the work that we were doing at our office. Uh, we're a very young uh, practice. We started two years ago. So I started a company in Dubai after moving from um, New York, where I was based. I was working for Shop Architects. Before that, I was based in Hong Kong. So my journey from the AA in London after doing my master's, leading up to Hong Kong and New York, and now to Dubai, has been you know, working for other architects, but pursuing the sort of practice of emergent technologies and putting it in practice. You know, I didn't want to get into this domain of architecture and technology and drift away from uh, what is currently going on in, in, in architectural practice. I wanted to ground it and have it be applied um, in um, you know, the, the, how we do work every day. And it's been actually quite uh, an interesting challenge because it's hard to find clients, obviously. You know, if you were to do uh, work that is a bit more sort of um, uh, traditional, it's uh, easier to find clients, uh, especially if you're a startup in architecture. Um, and the work that I'm going to be showing you is the result of us actually taking that niche. So it's a challenge, but at the same time, it has an advantage because being positioned in that space where we're working at the nexus of design and technology has helped us a lot to create this niche. And a lot of clients seek us specifically because we are doing this kind of work. Um, so I hope you find the, the talk interesting and um, I hope that it raises a lot of questions and sort of uh, raises your curiosity to, to know more about uh, these new technologies in, in architecture. Uh, the title of the talk is about uh, 3D printing, but it may, may be a, a little bit misleading. It, I, it's a more sort of general picture about technology and with a focus on 3D printing. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, let me see if I can help. Okay, so here we are. Um, so I think we went over this. Thank you to Pam. And uh, thank you to our sponsors as well for having me here. So as I've explained, um, our practice is uh, called Middle East Architecture Network, or MEAN for short, and it's a sort of um, counterpart to Middle East Architecture Lab, which is a research repository uh, that I've started following doing a series of workshops that uh, started at the AA, and uh, that research kind of is a nonlinear process, delving into technology and working with people that are interested uh, in this technology, whether uh, students or practitioners. In a short sort of format of 10 days, uh, we'd be working on a project that I set the brief and the agenda for, and that sort of project feeds into our practice. So it becomes sort of more streamlined into a concept and eventually into a design that responds to our clients sort of visions and wishes. And uh, the way that I've set up the, the practice is a bit non-traditional. Um, and looking at this sort of chart of emerging uh, practices in architecture today, uh, this chart was uh, visualized by Alejandro Zarapolo, looking at uh, new practices in architecture. I think we pray, I place ourselves in between the techno uh, critical, the technocratic, and the populist. And what I mean by that is that the work that we do at Middle East Architecture Lab is more sort of working at democratizing uh, technology and art and design. 
And uh, the work that we do is, at MEAN is combining that sort of research with a sort of real life application and how we can solve problems and challenges in our environments, in the built environment today. So technology is the answer, but what was the question, right? So why are we using these technologies? Why is it important to look into innovation for the design of our built environment today? This is a film by Stanley Kubrick. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this uh, movie, 2001 Space Odyssey. And this specific scene is very interesting because here we see an ape uh, discovering how to use a tool. And with that tool, they started hunting. And with hunting, their, their sort of uh, brains increased capacity and intelligence. And in the sort of greatest shift in, in cinematic history, the boom, the tool becomes a spaceship. And I want to stress on that point because it's very important to realize that technology is a tool at the end of the day. It's not a means to an end, it's just a way to improve your workflows. At the end of the day, good architecture is good architecture, and bad architecture is bad architecture, even though you use the most current tools. And for us, place, context, materiality, uh, programmatic functions, the needs of the client are at the top of the list, and then we look into new tools we learn how to use those tools to improve our workflows, to improve our efficiency, and to improve our response in responding to those uh, sort of set of parameters. And it's not a new idea, right? This is an example here in Malaysia of how technology was used in the 60s. And this is a very radical building. When I was there, and I was very shocked to hear that it was done in the, in the 60s, uh, mid-60s, we were looking at a, a mosque, which traditionally is a very sort of uh, hard building typology to get innovative in, right? It, there's a lot of restraint, there's a lot of, uh, you know, people want to retain the traditional elements of a mosque, so it's very challenging to be innovative in a mosque. But here we're looking at probably one of the most innovative mosques that I've seen. You have a lot of building technology embedded in this mosque, especially for the time it was built. You know, you have a lot of CNC milling, a lot of um, innovation in the form itself. So you see the dome has been folded instead of having a sort of hemispherical dome. You have a lot of uh, precast concrete. And those are all, at the time, were highly innovative technologies. And someone had the guts to say, we are building this mosque this way. We're following the Malaysian tradition. And we're also looking at the future. And that's why this mosque is relevant today, in my opinion. That's why we're looking at it in the presentation, which is talking about technology and the future of architecture. So at Middle East Architecture Lab, I'll show some of the projects that we've done. We started at the DAA in London, and we spread out uh, around the world. Um, we have done workshops in over 20 countries today, starting in Jordan, and uh, our continuous workshop is now set up in Dubai since uh, 2014. Uh, our team is not that big, but uh, they're very highly specialized in the stuff that we do. Um, so I'm directing the project, but I have amazing people working with me. And we've attracted people from all over the world to come participate in, in these workshops. And I'm here actually based on an invitation of, of one of them. Warf was one of the participants in one of the years. He was interested in 3D printing. And as one of the practicing uh, architects, uh, sort of uh, practicing architects joining us, uh, he brought in a lot to the table. And that's how we work. It's a very sort of collaborative environment. In this project, for example, in Jordan, we set out to the south of Jordan, to the desert, to look at the morphology of the environment. And uh, we took notes, we got back to our studio, and we looked at new tools, so learning as we're doing, um, new tools of how we can sort of mill limestone uh, to these formations, or 3D print with sand and new materials. In Business School Dubai, uh, we are looking at um, sort of a, a series of different uh, technologies. In this particular school, uh, we looked at robotics, so we had um, a tutor that uh, came in with a kit of parts to make a robot. The robot was programmed by the, or, uh, first, of, first of all, built, designed, built, and then programmed by the participants to uh, pick up items, to you know, do very small tasks. But I'll show you the idea behind what I'm showing here, because this is almost like a, a work in progress, right? We're not looking at an end result. We're looking at what is the potential of 
you know, doing this kind of work, especially in the context that we're in. So as you see, it's a very collaborative environment. It's a very sort of charged environment. We work for 12 hours a day. Uh, it's a lot of hard work. But then the result is very promising because Suryansh's startup, Suryansh is the, the tutor that came in with the robot kit of parts, raised $7.4 million for its product, Automata, which is an evolution of what that robot that you just saw is. So it started from there. That was built in Visiting School Dubai. Now it's a product that is a desktop 3D printing robot that you can buy online. And this is obviously because of his hard work, the dedication, and you know, borderline genius. But again, that platform, having you know, people working together to develop something, gets here someday. And that's the point that I'd like to make with this particular project. This is a, a, a robot that you can actually buy for your home or office that could uh, pick up things or 3D print or uh, do anything your arm can do. So you need to program it, obviously, but um, it's a six-axis machine. And they're working on democratizing ro robotics for uh, you know, personal use. In Business School Dubai uh, 3, we looked at uh, tensile membranes and um, sort of interaction design. So we're looking at um, simulations that are projected onto this uh, lightweight fabric structure. Uh, the idea here is that we, instead of working in groups, we work together on this one project. And over 10 days, we designed this uh, structure that was laser cut from pieces of fabric and then stretched onto this um, uh, lightweight rod that is used for kite surfing. Um, so it's a glass fiber reinforced polymer rod, uh, a self-standing structure, and those uh, simulations are projected onto the structure, but then through tactile interaction or through sound, you can actually speak to the structure and you can touch it and it will react to your sound and, and touch. And we had uh, an exhibition around this. That's the structure itself. Don't worry, we'll get to architecture in a minute. That's uh, the, the, the project we did uh, the year before last year. Uh, and it was around 3D printing. So we, as Wyeth has explained, there's this initiative with 3D printing in Dubai, and I thought this would be very interesting as an opportunity. We have Expo coming up. We have all these different spaces that we can activate with 3D printed structures. Why don't we do a workshop about 3D printing, large-scale uh, additive manufacturing in architecture? And the result was four projects. Um, so this is one, one group, two teams. And each team envisioned a project. The one to the left is a kiosk for D3. The one to the right is a water taxi station. And the idea behind all the projects that you're going to see is that we have a modular component that is 3D printed, repeated, and then from that you get a structure. So the one to the left is a 3D printed bus stop. And the one to the right is a Tesla charging pod with embedded uh, solar roof uh, for capturing uh, sun energy a uh, way to sort of charge the Tesla car. So the reason why I'm showing this and the reason why I think this is relevant is because one project that you'll see in the future of this presentation is a 3D printed bus stop that was commissioned to us by the Roads and Transport Authority of Dubai after coming to the exhibition that we hosted for this workshop. So that's how we worked. We, we do all these experiments and eventually it leads somewhere in practice. And we get commissioned for projects that are innovative and we get to actually have a bit at introducing something new to our city. So that's the exhi exhibition that we, we had uh, held after the 10-day workshop. And this is the uh, sort of presentation video for uh, the 3D printed bus stop that was developed in that workshop. But then we, we developed it further uh, once we got commissioned for it. So this was developed by the students and their tutor uh, through that research project. And the idea is that it uses minimal surfaces, or surfaces of uh, mean curvature zero, to um, create this building block that is 3D printed, and then um, eventually leading up to you know, a, a larger form, and then eventually to uh, the form of the bus stop. So I wouldn't dwell too much on this, but you can see, you can, you know, it zooms into detail, and, and you can see the different uh, various uh, processes behind it. I think there's uh, more interesting slides to come. 
so I'll move on. Uh, for the last workshop that we've done with the AA, uh, the title of the workshop was Additive Stereotomy, and the idea is that we are using additive manufacturing and stereotomy, which is a concept in, in uh, architecture, where we're basically cutting solids that interlock to create a structural system. And because of the geometry of these solids, uh, there is no need for mortar. It's basically a system held with friction. And um, because of 3D printing, we can reach that level of resolution in the detail that you, know, you see here with introducing some force, you can actually collapse the entire structure. These are 3D printable parts. Now, this is from a uh, much sort of it's a PhD thesis of, of something like this, but we're working within a 10-day workshop with inexperienced students. And what we've done is basically, we had uh, about 30 students join this workshop. This is our lab in Dubai. And we have a lot of 3D printers. Uh, we have people joining us from all over the world. This is one of the earliest prototypes that we had for, for this particular workshop. And you can see the prototypes being uh, 3D printed in-house. And then at the end, we have a, a presentation about the outcomes and the exhibition again. The first group envisioned a shell structure where you have these interlocking parts. So you can see how the parts interlock. They're designed to be almost assembled like Lego. And it's a sort of um, freeform structure uh, designed for D3. There's no particular function for the structure. We're looking more at the structural capacity the geometry, the technology behind building it, and we sort of neglected, we put aside, let's say, the function for, for a minute, and let's say we just focused on these other parameters. And um, this is a small video of how you can sort of uh, experience the space. So you can see here on the side how there are, there's sort of almost like a flap for these um, blocks to interlock. This is the 3D model that was printed over the 10 days. So all these components were printed individually. There's a string in the center of each one of these components that sort of tells everything in tension. The other project was a drone port that was uh, also envisioned for 3D printing. And the idea is that it's almost like, like a tree where drones come to sort of nest and charge themselves and then continue. Uh, so it harvests sun energy. It's set up on the rooftops of buildings, and drones could come to recharge. Uh, as we know, you know, a lot of uh, services now are experimenting with drones for delivery, like Amazon. Uh, so drones could be a thing of the future, and this is almost like a station for these drones to sit, sit and rest. So that's the 3D model. You can see how it grows. It's also interlocking parts that are 3D printed, and um, there's a steel sort of tension cable to hold, hold everything together. That's the perspective, and that's a 3D model. So these models are huge, about a meter in, in width, and it's a test of the idea. So it's a, almost, you know, you can see that it's standing at that scale, and it's a test of the connections, it's a test of the materiality. Um, and it's something that we've developed over 10 days. Um, sort of more, um, let's say, um, commercial look at these uh, workshops is our collaboration with Apple. Apple came to us and said, what can you do with new technologies that we're investigating, like augmented reality? Uh, what if we give you some equipment from Apple and you play around with it and see what you can develop with that? The first experiment we've done is to say, you know, we're an architecture startup, we need a business card that's cool, uh, why not develop an app where if I give you my business card, you look at it in your camera and it opens our portfolio. So that's exactly what we developed in this one app here to the left. And then we said, okay, we just designed this 3D printed bus stop. We want to put it in context because as a bus stop, we want to see it in different locations. So why don't we design an app that allows us to do that? So we did an augmented reality um, sort of app for our bus stop to see it in different locations. And then the other one was kind of more of an ex immersive experience to walk through one of our uh, bridges that we designed for 3D printing. So that's the app that you see to the left. And then Apple, was like, okay, let's see if we can actually develop a, a program with you guys to uh, you know, popularize this idea and to see if we can uh, spread it around and have people come and participate. So we did um, a residency with Apple uh, around augmented reality for designers. And the idea is that we will be working at the Apple Store, uh, developing uh, sort of 
uh, workflows for designers in augmented reality to help them as a technology. And, um, you know, this is the app that I just showed for the bus stop. We started with that. This is the other app for uh, the bridge. You can see here I'm walking with my iPad. This is through my iPad camera. You can see actually in the background you'll see our office. So this is reality juxtaposed with virtuality. And uh, you know what I'm looking at is actual plans from our office. But I'm inside a 3D model and I'm walking through it on my iPad. And I'm seeing everything here on my camera. You can see me here in the reflection of the glass. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, an unusual way to showcase a model. But it becomes very useful for architects because, you know, imagine if you can just go with your iPad to your client and say, here's a SketchUp model. Let's look at it on your table. Let's take notes on the model itself instead of building the model before the design has been completed. One idea we've tested as well is we had developed a 3D printed uh, sort of uh, product uh, line. And the idea here is that we wanted to see the lamp that we developed on the table. So that's another sort of small app that we developed. But then at the end, what we ended up doing for the residency is a much simpler workflow. We start with sketching a design for an interior. Then we start modeling it on the iPad. So the year I sketched the plan, that's actually for a project that we had for an interior in Dubai. Sketch the plan, then 3D, uh, um, 3D modeled it on an iPad uh, with a pencil. And then you can see it on my table with the furniture, everything. You can see the spaces and how the interaction of the spaces works. And you can actually kind of tilt and see the, the, the facade. You can see inside the glass, etc. cetera. Um, you know, nothing you can do on a desktop computer. But then an iPad is a lot more portable and you can actually add notes on, uh, on your model, which is quite great. Because here, the background is actually what's on my screen. But uh, now we're inside the model. So this is all me moving my iPad and, and showing the different sort of spaces. And this is a video of the project. So it was open for the participation, it was completely free to attend. Um, and what was great is that you know anybody in the Apple Store could actually walk in and take part in this. They don't have to be a designer, they don't have to be an architect. You can immediately get into an iPad and start working with us. It's very simple to get into the workflow and then you can sort of envision these different 3D models that you can actually uh, manipulate in augmented reality. Uh, the ideas that came out of the workshop from people that are less experienced in design were the most sort of fantastic because we had people like looking into really crazy things. We had a participant here that, you know, imagined a chair and people were trying to sit on it, but it's an augmented reality. It was, it was a very fun workshop. Anyway, that's the work that we do on the research part. But in practice, uh, we have a small office in D3 and a very small team. Uh, here, the office is when we first established it. Uh, we had a lot of people coming and visiting and then we decided to do, throw an open house I was just showing some uh, uh, videos of our office. And the first project that we started off with is, you know, following what Lerth was talking about, uh, about the sort of uh, 3D printing initiative, uh, we were interested in having a center for all these workshops that we're doing and to have sort of, uh, to open participation for people to come and experience 3D printing and to have them, you know, work in a collaborative environment, almost like a co-working space for 3D printing for designers. And we looked at all these different statistics for 3D printing. You know, 3D printing is an exponentially growing technology. And it's very quickly being adopted into architecture. We all know that architecture is a, is a very slow profession that is very resistant to change. Uh, but at the same time, we have had a lot of technologies being embedded in our profession that have changed how we think about space and um, how we sort of respond to our clients' briefs. Um, in Dubai in particular, which is a great platform for this, there's a, a very big sort of shift towards 3D printing because it's a sustainable method for construction. You're using a lot less material. Instead of casting concrete, you can just 3D print it in layers, so you're not building the structure twice. Uh, you need a lot less labor. Um, 
the sort of construction process t takes a lot less time, uh, and it's you know a more sustainable method to, to build altogether. That's in addition to more freedom in design because you can you can have more sort of flowy spaces. You can design geometries that you cannot or would be a lot more expensive to build in traditional methods. And it, so, in a nutshell, the, the technology has a lot of potential and a lot of sort of um, benefits. So we looked at um, the current state of what Dubai is as an infrastructure, as a city to, to, to promote this idea. And we thought, you know, we've been doing all these workshops. We've had a really hard time finding a lab. And this was before the lab that I showed you was set up. So this was before we started our company. Um, that was the first project that we started with. We said we wanted to build a space that allows us to open this participation. And this is what we were looking at as a sort of outcome from the space is uh, products ranging from sort of smaller scale installations to actual sort of uh, household uh, products and to something more utilitarian as in, you know, maybe social housing or low cost ho housing that could be built in over, you know, maybe a few weeks. And then for services, we've had, uh, you know, a lot of sort of program introduced into this. We have a, a time scale. So we're looking at uh, sort of imaginary brief, an imaginary client, and we're designing something based on what we think could work. Um, the spatial sort of layout was designed around a business model that we developed, also completely hypothetical, and the percentages of how the spaces were uh, designed were based on how much we can sort of generate this profit per square foot. Now obviously a lot of the square footage of the space itself is not generating a lot of profit, so some spaces have to compensate for others. This is a sectional model of the entire space. So starting with a sort of reception space where you have a coffee shop that could also bring in uh, some money into the space. We had a space upstairs for co-working and workshops. People can bring their laptops and, and work in groups on uh, design, architecture, etc. So could be a space for startups in, in design. And a fab lab equipped with the latest technologies in digital fabrication. The people in these renders were actually taken from five-year archive of workshops that we've done in Dubai. A small-scale installation that we started with after that was um, commissioned by Amman Design Week in Jordan. And the idea was looking at uh, sort of raising awareness around water scarcity problems. That, you know, Jordan is a very poor country in water supplies. And we're looking at that uh, through the design of this installation that was commissioned by uh, Design Week. The idea was that we wanted to also use natural materials that are abundant in Jordan. So limestone is a material that is uh, abundant uh, there, and it's very much used in, uh, in, in construction. We also combined it with steel, um, and that we rusted. And we had a workflow designed around how we can sort of make those geometries. Of, um, it, was, it was almost like a geometry of cracking, uh, that happens at Earth once you have dryness. So these, these pieces were designed using an algorithm that allows us to crack a piece of geometry on a computer into 120 unique pieces. And we can control how many pieces we like, and it just makes that sort of organic cracking geometry. Now, another workflow that we needed is how do we output these models so we can give them to our fabricators so that they understand what is the sequence of building them and then assembling them. So what the model that you're seeing here is doing is going through them in a certain sequence from the center out and then developing, spitting out basically every model at the center into a new file from the 3D model at the bottom. And this is what we get. We get a plan with a sequence that is computer, completely computer generated. Uh, those pieces were to be milled using a robotic arm out of limestone and the builder could use the sequence to basically assemble everything onto the steel base. This is the final piece in Amman Design Week. Uh, the pieces of stone were just laid onto the steel base. And this is a short video of how that process worked. So we had this very nice duality that we thought in the video of fire coming from steel, water coming from stone, 
those are sort of natural by byproducts of, of sort of milling or machining the material and uh, preparing it for it becoming something uh, closer to the 3D model. Uh, now we also had this combination of a machine making or carving a piece of stone or a robot carving a piece of stone and then the sort of manual labor of you know uh, people putting these laser cut or water jet cut steel pieces together to assemble the, the entire piece. So it was a very nice duality and uh, the people that worked on it, on it really enjoyed the process. It was a fun project. It was very sort of educational in many ways and it garnered a lot of attention. Actually, Her Majesty Queen, Queen Rania came to see it and then she commissioned it to be moved to the National Museum. So it's sitting there permanently in Jordan. That was our first project in construction, very small scale. Um, this one uh, I did uh, with Andrew Cutlass before actually uh, moving to New York. Um, and the reason why I put this is because, I guess, you know, geographically Hong Kong is not too far from here. Uh, but then you can see also as a project that was done in 2012, the amount of complexity that we can get from technology, from machines, helping us to build things. Um, Willow is a project that we did in New York uh, for a competition. The idea is that we wanted to have a modular system for a canopy that could be organized in different uh, ways, uh, that could deflect sunlight, deflect uh, wind or rain, and it would be almost like a kit of parts, like an IKEA kit of parts that you can assemble onto the site. Um, the site was Socrates Sculpture Park. And um, in addition to the steel frame, you have these sort of um, these, uh, these leaves, so to speak, that uh, could uh, add to the sort of uh, sheltering aspect of the, of the design. And here you can see it in different uh, organizations. And this is a 3D printed project. Um, this is the project that I was speaking about. This is um, commissioned actually by the government of Dubai. So the Roads and Transport Authority saw the project that we did for the workshop and then they, they gave us a set of parameters to work with. They said, why don't you take these standards that we use for 3D printing, or sorry, for designing a bus stop and use them in com combination with 3D printing to see what you could come up with. And we started looking at different inspiration. Uh, we thought, you know, seashells are a perfect inspiration because actually as a process that occurs in nature, uh, seashells are built through sedimentation. So it's almost like an additive manufacturing in biology and we wanted to use that analogy to design the bus stop which was also using stereotomy so it was coming together as a kit of parts you'd have all these different modules that are 3d printed off-site and then brought onto site and then interlocking and we had an exhibition at rta to, to show the potential of what a 3d printed bus stop could be this is the ceo of rta uh, and uh, we were presenting to him uh, our project. This was also one of our first projects in, in Dubai, and here's a short video of how it works. SADAC is a 3D printed bus stop scheme developed by MEAN, Middle East Architecture Network, for the Roads and Transport Authority, RTA. The project proposes a future where 3D printing is utilized to build the infrastructure of the city of Dubai. The design is inspired by the form of the seashells found on the beaches of the city. Addictive manufacturing is a process found in nature in which layers of material are added to make complex, optimal structures a process that saves time, resources and energy. The bus stop is designed to be panelized in pieces, which would fit the bounding box of industrial 3D printers. Every piece is unique and interlocks with its neighbor to easily construct the structure. The modules of the bus stop could be transported to 2,000 locations across the city and assembled into a durable, efficient structure. A bus stop that gives a new identity to the city of Dubai. So we wanted also a form that could go in different locations. Like we didn't want, we, this for example is Jumeirah, which is a more residential area. Um, this is in, you know, a more sort of the old part of town in, in Dubai. Uh, so a, a more, uh, you know, the surrounding are, is, is a lot more traditional architecture. And then here in the sort of uh, fanciest part of town, which is the boulevard. And we thought, you know, if we have this enclosure, 
and we have that complexity, why not also integrate some certain technologies like you know, lighting or maybe a technology where you can speak to the bus stop and it can tell you your next uh, bus, when is it arriving, when is, uh, what is the bus schedule basically, similar to Alexa. So we had all these different ideas and um, it was a good response to what RTA wanted, but um, unfortunately until now they had, didn't really go through for the project, but uh, it was a nice experience for us as well. You'll see that, you know, as an architecture startup, a lot of our projects are actually not completed. <laughs> but we keep, continue pushing for them because we, we believe that, you know, eventually we'll get small projects and then we can scale that up as we go. For this project, we, it was set in Seoul, and the idea was that we wanted to um, participate in this competition for a ferry terminal. It was a great project because it was for the government and the, the list of documents that we had produced was very big, so it was a very good practice for our office. The idea was that we wanted to have a roof structure that is, um, you know, kind of inspired by the traditional roof making, which Koreans are very well known for. And uh, we were looking at these elements, which are called giwas, uh, which basically have different functions. So the ones at the periphery, for example, deter evil spirits. The ones at the top would deflect rainwater, etc. And we wanted to develop our own system for giwas, so we de designed a project that is based around the roof. The entire sort of spatial layout underneath is based around this roof that changes its geometry, that becomes almost um, you know, uh, different functions, um, such as a sort of um, an area for buskers here in the center, or a lookout point at the top. And here's the system behind it. So these different viewers that we imagined, uh, some of them would have uh, solar panels that you can walk on. So Tesla was developing these solar uh, panels that are very durable, that are made of glass. And uh, because of the large surface area, we actually calculated that over 50 years, the building would actually pay for itself in energy saving. The other giwas were for uh, places for sitting, for example, or bringing light in. So there are some pixels for bringing some natural light into the, the, the space. This is the plan and some drawings of the different spaces. I won't go too much into that. Um, but this is it from aerial view. Um, you can see the different piers for uh, the, the ferries to come and stop in. This is an area for sort of looking out to the water. There's an area for buskers. This is where you wait for your ferry. There's also a coffee shop element to it in the restaurant. And you can see the beam and column structure is a sort of CNC bent um, uh, structure that we wanted to have almost interweave because in traditional Korean uh, roof making, they use uh, wood and they sort of interweave the beams in, 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 a, in a way that's very interesting, almost like a lattice. But we wanted to also connect that to the column through bending that uh, sort of uh, beam into a column. So the touch points are sort of very smoothly coming in from a beam to a column. Here's the waiting area where you wait for your ferry. This is the top of the structure where you can go up and sort of enjoy the views onto the, the water. And you can see some of these become almost like a chair. The Korean pop, uh, K pop uh, band taking a selfie there. And this is where you would look at buskers, for example. Almost like an auditorium for buskers. This is a view from the adjacent park. And one of our first sort of projects as a space um, was commissioned by Audi. So Audi had this idea that we wanted to, they wanted to create a, an innovation hub for Design Week, Dubai Design Week. So they wanted to have a space where they would showcase their car, but also have talks, uh, sort of hand out the prize for Audi Innovation Award, um, and have all these events happening in, uh, in the Audi hub throughout Design Week. And Audi is a major sponsor for Design Week, for uh, Design Week Dubai. And they had this um, theme for the year was connections. So we were looking at, uh, and we were the first people to sort of get hired for this project. It was a very new idea, and we were new on the scene in architecture in Dubai, and they thought, okay, these guys are working with technology, we want an innovation space, why don't we give them the project and see how it goes. Um, so we're looking at the theme of connections, and looking at the site, so this is the usable area of the site, this is where we can actually build something. 
We wanted to create a structure that is very lightweight because the budget was very small. We wanted to create something that would encompass the sort of this, this energy, this, this, uh, this idea of innovation in a, in a way that's almost open to outside, but um, still you feel like you're in a different space when you walk in. And we wanted to have some sort of sheltering element. So this uh, sort of curved space here, uh, or curved uh, canopy here, is um, for sheltering from, from, from sunlight. So the idea was that the structure was almost completely in tension. So it's uh, balancing uh, each other out. And all these different um, CNC bent uh, pipe elements are uh, taught together with tension cables. So here's a closer look at the structure. And then once you have these different elements uh, connected together with this tension cable, you start getting all these different spaces, these ruled surfaces that are open, but still you feel like you're in a different space inside. That's going inside the structure. I mean, you will never see this view, but it's uh, just to explain the structure. And these are the different elements. Another um, idea that we had for building the space was that we wanted to use a very unique cladding system. And in this idea, we reached out to BIA, which is a, a sort of a company that recycles rubber tires for making um, panels for flooring. We said, we want a black rubber tire that contrasts our stark white interiors. And uh, looking at statistics of how tires are being sort of dumped into the environment, the only way to get rid of a rubber tire is to burn it. So if we're looking at a car company and innovation, we really have to look into ways of how we can reduce that waste. And this was a great way for us to make a bespoke material for our structure that would encourage the reuse of rubber tires into a completely new building material. So BS said yes, and they sort of um, uh, started making those black uh, tiles based on our standards. So it's basically just uh, compressed pellets of uh, recycled shredded tires that make this uh, very beautiful black material. And uh, the inside wall was just a white uh, aluminum panel. And uh, we noticed that obviously you get this moiré effect when you have all these different interconnecting uh, lines of the, of the tension cables. Uh, and we wanted a structure where you can sort of disassemble it and set it up somewhere else. So the structure itself could be recycled for different events. Here's a walk around the structure. And we wanted the lighting to be integrated within the panel itself. So here's a mock-up for the lighting. This is the detail for that. The, the interior of the canopy almost resembles a night sky with the, with the stars. And then the, the canopy had to be open so that once we build that structure, so everything was prefabricated, brought, brought into site, and then set up again. Once we set up that canopy structure, the car had to be sort of driven into the space, and then we built everything around it. So that, gate, so that sort of gateway at the back is a result of that. So we had sort of almost like a double entry system and then two uh, exits from the So this is the structure during uh, design week. Some plans. The plan had to be flexible so we can have it in a layout where you'd have a talk, like for example here, people could watch the talk or it would be a more informal lay layout. Some elevations. And from render to reality, obviously because of technology, everything is taken from a computer model and then built using a machine. You can see there's very little room for error. You know, the, the render almost looks identical to the structure itself. And then there was this moment of truth, you know, the empty site. So we had people working over um, 10 days to set up everything. Obviously it was prefabricated and then uh, it was just about putting these pieces together. We had uh, 3D printed furniture uh, that we printed in uh, Spain using this robot that was made for the pavilion. We had about 30 of these chairs. This is a sort of stop motion of, of the whole thing being assembled.
kids loved it, so people were sort of attracted to it, and we had this award there. This is an aerial view of the structure, some day shots. Um, how are we doing on time? Yeah, 15 more minutes? Okay, I'll show two more projects. Um, this project uh, is basically a recycle project. So we had a client, we had a big government client from Saudi Arabia, and we thought, yes, this is our break. We're gonna do it. <laughs> Finally, we're gonna build a building that is 3D printed. And uh, our partner on it was Acom. Um, we had an amazing sort of breakthrough in the design. They loved it. Everything was going so well. And all of a sudden, we don't hear back for like 10 months. So I thought, you know, we worked so hard on this project and we really like it. Why don't we just rehash it, put it in a completely different context, and then it's a completely different project, right? So we put the same structure that we designed for um, a government in a different country in Jordan, which is my home country. So we put it in Wadi Rum, which is in the south of Jordan, and uh, it's a really beautiful sort of environment. Uh, ooh, sorry. So it's a really beautiful sort of serene environment, and uh, the idea of the structure itself was taken from the idea of looking at magnetic fields. So we programmed those magnetic fields as a physical sort of, um, as a physical phenomena. We made an algorithm similar to the cracking algorithm that I showed you, but for magnetic fields, and we used that to design the entire thing. And that was for a different project, but then you know we put it in this environment um, as a sort of canopy, because the idea was that uh, you know it's also taking from the heritage the traditions of the place. And then here is an environment where Bedouins live, um, and Bedouins use tents for living. Um, so again, this is the sort of magnetic field uh, script that we manipulated to get the different sort of spaces for the floor plan. And then we have this canopy that is almost like a, a tent form. And then when we overlap these two scripts together, we start getting these panels that we, be, we would be 3D printing uh, using a robot and assembling onto a steel frame. So this is not a, a self-sustaining structure for, that is 3D printed. It's almost like a panel that is a freeform panel. And um, really, there is no way to build this other than to 3D print it. Because in any other manufacturing technology, it will be very difficult, it will be very expensive. Uh, so here we're finding ways of how we can sort of use the technology to create new architecture, so to speak. So this is how the panels come together. And the panels are designed around the parameters of what a robot could actually print. So there's a strength for the size. This is the floor plan. The floor plan was also meant to be 3D printed, but in concrete. So you have this the nice uh, uh, topology going up the, into the structure. It's almost, we designed it as an oasis in the desert in this, in this, uh, in this particular case. So we changed the design a little bit, not too much, but was still something that would sort of fit the environment a bit more. And then we had inside these funnels some greenery. So we introduced some greenery into these funnels for um, sort of having this oasis uh, uh, interior um, sort of effect. Some elevations. And that's the actual structure. So you can see from uh, far, we, we sort of, it was a very sort of um, demanding, computationally demanding script to design every piece of the tessellation because we wanted to see exactly what it would look like within the restraints of a robot. So there are certain spans between these small elements here that we have to go by. And obviously this, the form of the panel, you can see the, the ridges between each panel and the next one. We wanted that to be a design decision. We didn't want it to be an afterthought because just to completely destroy the design. So it ended up working very well together as a design. So we imagined this almost like as a rest stop for tourists coming into Wadiram, which is, Wadiram is visited very well by tourists. And people can come and relax and maybe enjoy a night, a night there, uh, just uh, you know, 
having coffee with the Bedouins. And then obviously the lighting had to go with the structure, so we designed the lighting so that it would be sort of flexible LED that you can attach onto the, the, the pipes. So Expo 2020 is coming up, and we had um, participated in this competition for imagining um, a sort of water fountain for Expo. And um, you know, we thought we could do something that would actually be picked up and uh, you know, sort of introduced to the Expo ground, or we do something really crazy and we see where it goes. So we went for the crazy option. The idea was that we want to see adopting from nature um, or adapted, or sort of looking at nature for inspiration, uh, we wanted to see how we can harvest energy from thin air. And here, we're looking at an example in nature that does that. So the Namibian desert beetle harvests moisture from, nature, uh, from, from, from air through uh, condensation and then uses it to uh, basically uh, get its own water. And then we also looked at the geometry of cactus and how the Philotaxis sort of phenomena um, is used to sort of self-shade the plant itself so that it can retain its, uh, its water. And we looked at technology that would actually allow us to do this. So there are panel, if there are technologies out there right now that could harness moisture from humid air. Now Dubai is very well known for its humidity. Uh, also in Kuala Lumpur, I, you know, my experience is very humid here. So this is a system where you can actually harness humidity from uh, air and also harness solar uh, uh, energy for lighting the, 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 the sort of this uh, swatter feature. This moisture is brought into an underground sort of um, system that purifies that water and then brings it, it cools it and then brings it up for uh, sort of use. So this is the, the form of the actual water fountain you can open each one of these sinks at different heights, so accommodates people of different heights, and you can enjoy the water from there. And this is how the structure opens. This is the plan. We imagine also different colorways of, of the product itself, where it could be assembled on different locations in the expo ground. And also birds can drink from it, I guess. And this is a small video of how it works. desert plants and there would be some sort of sensing mechanism where you can sort of wave at it and then it would open and the water would come out automatically and then the drainage from the excess water could be brought in and then filtered and brought uh, chilled and then brought up again so we didn't win the competition but we, we you know we thought we did the design that we would participate with um, and okay, just two more, two more projects. Yeah. This is really quick. So this is a product line that we designed uh, for production in the office. And the idea is that again we were looking at the sort of different forms of desert plants, but we're also developing a script where we can actually manipulate that script and um, almost use it as a DNA to make different forms of uh, of lamps. So the idea here is that you can use the same script to make an infinite amount of lamps, and each lamp would be completely different. Just by changing certain parameters, almost like pottery, these sort of periphery of the different um, uh, sort of uh, sections of the, of the form would change to make different lamps. And we tested it, it actually works quite well. Uh, the only thing is that it needs some integration with web uh, sort of platforms, where you can go and actually change the parameters yourself and make your own lab, and then 3D print it, and we'll ship it to you. This is one lamp that we designed. 
This is an actual photo of it. Uh, the idea here is that we use the technology that's very high resolution. So in this uh, particular instance, uh, it was very expensive to produce this lamp. It costs around $1,000 to produce it, which is insane. It's about this big. But um, we developed that, and I'll show you how. You can see the amount of resolution, and then also we use the material that's kind of translucent. So you can get some light through the material itself, but also some light through the different sort of crevices of how the structure works. So there are different layers and then different periphery. And those different layers and different periphery all act together because they're all linked together. So almost these lines are linked together almost like a truss. So if you make a cross section of this model, as I showed here, you can see it's almost like a truss. And that's almost like the structural system of the, mo of the, of the light itself but also how the light go through it, goes through it was another sort of study that we wanted to investigate. So you can see how the light goes through it and creates this complexity between the different layers. And this is how it comes out of the printer. Uh, it's almost like a scene from an alien movie or something, you know, it's like born out of this mucusy substance. But uh, the idea is that this machine just freezes layers of, of resin at, at different sections and then when it comes out of the resin all the support material is being drained out and then you get this it's a very expensive process today um, but I mean we got something a tenth of the price maybe even less actually one hundredth of the price yeah one hundredth of the price printing it in our own office and the result wasn't really that much different so this is something we printed in our office. It comes out really messy from the printer, as you can see. But then uh, there's two materials here. So we bought this new printer that extrudes two materials. One material uh, is water soluble, so we use it for support, because as you're printing, you need to support any cantilever that's coming out of the structure. So that material is printed with a water soluble material. And the other... Um, is that for me to stop? Or? <laughs> I mean, I can't get, because I have a timer here, but it's not working. <laughs> so, but I can see that we're one hour in, right? So I'll, I'll be very quick. The other material is not water soluble. So when you put the entire thing in water, it comes up uh, like this. So the result is not that much different, but you know, there's still, you know, the level of resolution that we got in the other uh, print was much higher. And also here, we cannot print bigger than a certain size, and this is a family of the different sort of uh, lamps that we, that we designed from the same algorithm by changing some, some parameters. And that was kind of a, a, a lead to a project that we did at full scale. So that experiment in uh, light, almost like making a scaled model, led us to designing the structure for the IFC, the Dubai International Financial Center, came to us and said, we want a 3D printed structure. That's what we want. We want an installation that is 3D printed. And we have a, an event called Arts Night, and we want you guys to have the sort of, the main piece as a sort of uh, design uh, company, and you, you have absolute freedom of what you can design. Um, but we wanted to respond to the theme, which is autumn. So this was in October of last year. And we looked at, uh, you know, in Dubai, we don't really have autumn. <laughs> autumn in Dubai is actually really nice weather. <laughs> so we're looking, and we, we don't really have much trees. So we're looking at, you know, what, is, what can we do to do that? Uh, how can we achieve this sort of uh, effect for autumn? And uh, first, we started obviously by looking at different technology that we can use. This is one from AI Build, which is 3D printing in polymers, but at a very large scale using robots. And this is one uh, by B6, which is printing in concrete. So we wanted to hybridize those two to create a sort of experiment at full scale where we can have a base that is 3D printed in concrete and then the top parts printed in a polymer. And then obviously we wanted to use that research from interlocking parts to make the structure. So everything almost interlocks as Lego. This is the site in DIFC and this is the structure that we uh, designed. So it's almost like a passage and the, the algorithm that we developed because we were given a certain budget it tells us exactly how much square footage of 3D printing anything we can get out of that budget. So once we exceed the budget, it almost like it flags red, you know? 
So if I change the parameters, if I, if I make those fingers a bit more dense, they'll be like, oh, you went over budget. If I make them more sparse, then the client would say, oh, they're too sparse. So it's between the algorithm and, and my client trying to figure out the sort of structure. And we wanted it to not have a sort of roof because that was a bit too risky. We were testing too many things at once. So we designed almost like a passage. And the passage was for us a reminder of what a, sort of a walk through deciduous trees would be like. And these are trees that shed their leaves in autumn. And we thought, you know, what if we design something that reminds us of that, almost like an artificial nature in a super artificial place with no autumn. So these are the different parts that interlock together. They're also designed within the parameters of a robot. This is how the robot would 3D print the base. And then under the base is a flooring made out of wood that is CNC cut. It's a plan, innovations. And that's the footing detail where we actually cast concrete inside the plastic parts at the bottom to hybridize the concrete 3D print. So the sort of pyramid shape here that's 3D printed in concrete. And then we cast concrete into between the plastic and the, and the concrete uh, 3D print to stabilize those uh, sort of fingers. So this is the plan going up. And every part was uh, tagged. And then our manufacturer in London AI build was tagging those parts and sending them to us as we go. We had two weeks to manufacture the entire thing and ship it from London. <laughs> Which was, you know, I didn't sleep for two weeks like then. But then they were sending me those uh, stop motion, seeing the design from the computer being constructed using robots. It was a very surreal moment seeing that actually, you know, maybe we can actually get it done. So one thing to note is that uh, the material for this structure was made from 30,000 recycled water bottles. So we use a material supplier that recycles water bottles and turns them into filament for 3D printing. And you can see again, you know, there's very little amount of error or difference between, there's a camera angle, but the difference between the actual 3D model and the, and the final product was not that big. The base was printed in uh, white concrete. That's why it looks that way. The actual material looks white, which is great. These are all photos. You can still see some of the seams in the plastic, but the concrete came out quite nice, actually. I was very happy with that. And here's a short video of how it worked. This is a 3D printed pavilion designed by me for DIFC. The design resembles a botanical form, which is reminiscent of walking through a birch tree forest in autumn. So the tops of the, the pieces were actually spray painted. It invites us to revisit our relationship with nature. We use innovative technologies to design and fabrication of the project. And we use robotics to 3D print plastic filament that is recycled from 30,000 water bottles.
three sections for every colony. The total number of plastic parts is 160 pieces. this wrong because actually the system wouldn't allow you to do it in a like the opposite direction. Kids love playing inside of a pavilion because of its playful form. And for all other visitors of the structure, it was interesting to hear what the city was reminded them of. Interesting fact, towards the end of the project, it rained for two days straight under, under the, the pavilion and uh, the tips of those uh, sort of uh, columns were, uh, we thought, were collecting water. They were, but the concrete was absorbing it. So in like a day or so, it, we drilled through them and nothing was coming out. And uh, the reason why there's an opening at the top is because the, the robot won't be able to actually um, print smaller than that radius. So the last project I'll end with is um, an, a project for Expo. Once they saw our proposal for the, the water fountain, they said, okay, you guys are crazy, you didn't win because we can't actually make that, but we'll give you a project to see if we can actually pitch for. And the idea was that they wanted for the entrance of the Expo grounds to have a structure that is about 20 meters in diameter that would um, uh, sort of show the spirit of innovation for Expo and that would be inspired by the Expo logo. So we looked at the logo, we thought we'll, we'll create this sort of mound, almost like a mountain, like a small hill, uh, made out of these uh, concrete 3D printed elements that have this lighting sort of uh, fixture on them that would be interactive and that would have different lights throughout the day and night. And this is the roundabout. This is what the structure would look like. So you'd have these almost like trees like a concrete uh, forest, so to speak, that you can actually walk through. And then a, a sort of atrium at the center, which is completely open to the sky. The tops of these uh, columns would have uh, solar uh, panels that would capture sun energy and then project them onto lights uh, for use at night. So it's a completely self-sustaining uh, structure. That's what it looks like from the top, and that's what it looks like at night. And then we said, okay, if the budget was too small for this because they didn't really give us a budget, we can have a modular system where we can change the layout of the different parts and make less or more of what we need. supposed to do more than just to welcome people into Expo and we thought the idea was to actually also encourage pedestrians to walk through it um, also maybe bikes bicycles and to end you can look at uh, all of our projects online I tried to skim the presentation as much as possible, but I wanted to have a sort of a holistic view of our work and not just talk about a certain technology because at the end of the day, technology is a tool. Uh, thank you so much for listening and uh, I'm happy for any questions after this. Thank you. So that was only 15, was it 15 minutes over time? 20 minutes over time? That was a very interesting presentation, yeah? Thank you so much. And I just knew that the, uh, the city's pavilion was built in DIC. The whole building around it was designed and built by Hopkins. Right. I, I should have planned that. <laughs> Check it out. Is it still there? Uh, it was moved to the gate. Ah, uh, moved to the yeah. gate. Okay, okay. Which is still in DIC. Okay. 
So thank you so much uh, for the presentation, very good presentation, and uh, you know, uh, it was mind blowing as well. I would like to invite A.R. Sophie on the stage to give a token to our guest speaker today, and then we can move on to moderations, and then we open up to the floor for any questions or online. Oh, thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you to all of you for staying. And uh, so for now, I think um, it's just going to be me and Riyadh on, on stage, taking up questions from members of the floor or uh, from online. Um, and are they going to? So let's first open the floor if there is any question. Anyone? Don't be shy. You can be very skeptical and. Uh, <laughs> You can uh, be uh, very aggressive with your questions. Uh, yes, it's completely. Okay. Do yeah. that. Oh. Ah, yes. Please pass the mic. Uh, hi, Riyadh. Um, great presentation. Certainly very interesting. Uh, I don't think we see enough of it here in Malaysia. Uh, uh, my name is Sufyan. Um, um, I think we do a bit of print printing, but nothing close to, to what you do. Um, I, I think my question is basically around the, um, uh, the notion that you say every, every job or, or every project is an, is an experiment. Um, I guess the conventional notions of architecture, especially nowadays, is you want to try to uh, manage the risk, uh, especially in anything that's uh, considered abnormal, and I think most of your projects are all um, bespoke and prototypical every time. So, um, how how would you approach that as as uh, one an architectural practice, um, second uh, from a business point of view? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, actually. And uh, we were talking about this uh, before the presentation started. It's a big challenge. It's not easy to find, first of all, a client that would be looking for something like this. So you have to find a client that is willing to jump onto this adventure with you. And the other sort of end is, yeah, there is a lot of risk, but I think it's about managing the risk. So it's about moderation between how far can we push the experiment and how can we actually get results at the end of the day? Because any client would be not so happy with an experiment that fails, right? So it could be an experiment that maybe has a lot of failures along the way, but the end result has to be a success. And it's about moderating that sort of uh, process. Okay. Um, and we have a question online from one. In your experience, what's the biggest obstacle into the adoption of uh, 3D printing in the building industry? Um, I think uh, right now, just like any technology uh, in the past, 3D printing is very expensive, and I think that's the biggest challenge. Uh, it's becoming more uh, sort of um, it's becoming more commercialized because there are more people doing it. So maybe five years ago, there were only a few companies that could 3D print a building. Today, I get so many messages and emails from companies around the world that I haven't heard of before doing it and showing proof of concept. So I think as we go in the next 10 years, you'll see more of these contractors, more of these suppliers that can actually 3D print a large structure and it, that, that challenge would become smaller. I remember when, we, you know, when I was maybe 12, desktop printers, like desk jet printers were becoming popular, right? And back then, the only way to print a document from a computer was to use a very expensive, big uh, printer that was not available for households. So, you know, technology develops exponentially, 
And as 3D printing develops, it's going to become more sort of affordable and more available and would also become of a better quality. So I think uh, as of now, the biggest challenge is to actually get something done within the parameters that we have. Okay, is there any more questions? Um, I have a question, uh, tapping into what Sofia has mentioned just now, that we don't, use, we don't see much of the assemblage, actually we don't see it at all, to be honest. Um, you know, uh, you have been very inspiring, you know, uh, as an academic and also as a practitioner. And I've been in Dubai for almost five years now, and three years in Hong Kong before. And I see a lot of these workshops and people coming from, you know, who graduated from overseas and they came back and they started, you know, spreading this knowledge to the masses. And the thing is, we have this in Malaysia as well. I'm actually looking at a lot of people now that I know who were students of Roland Snook, Arthur Mamumani, some collaborators with uh, Gregory Epps. But we don't see it here in Malaysia. And I, I actually asked them, why, what is that? You know, why don't you spread around like uh, uh, what's happening in other countries? And then they were saying that they don't get a lot of support financially. Mostly. And also there's not a lot of equipment uh, um, that they can use to educate the masses. But I think that's not really an obstacle because you've proved that you know you can do it without all these uh, supports or equipment. And my question was more about what is, is your advice for these people, for these graduates who came back to Malaysia and you know having a hard time to uh, spread, spread this sort of uh, um, knowledge and you know uh, uh, interest among the public? <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's not easy to do something that hasn't been done so many times before, right? It's always, innovation is always difficult. So if you want to do projects that are innovative, you're going to face challenges. And one of those challenges is, we're talking about infrastructure, about how ready is your city for what you're thinking. And um, we're lucky because in Dubai there is a certain level of demand, you know. People are really interested in 3D printing. People are willing to maybe jump onto this uh, challenge. Um, I would say my advice would be, you know, just don't give up, you know, because the infrastructure at the end of the day could be provided. If you remember the project that I showed in Jordan, yeah. you know, Jordan has a much uh, smaller uh, level of uh, industrial infrastructure than Malaysia. Uh, but we got a project with robotics and stone done there. And at the end of the day, anything is possible, really. It's, uh, it sounds very cliche, but um, anything is possible. And if you put your, your head to it and you really sort of uh, try to look at uh, ways to solve problems rather than to think of what uh, you know, the challenges are, you can, you can do it. Perfect, perfect answer. So Zarif, uh, there you go. <laughs> so, uh -huh. um, uh, hi, any more questions hey. on the floor? <laughs> yeah. uh, hi, Rad. My name is Zarif. Um, uh, great presentation. Um, Finally, because I've, I've experienced a bit more of, of the 3D printing and robotics as well, um, what I find is struggling here in Asia is our the, the specific roles where it's, it's a very gray area where you, from a designer, you become a fabricator, where it's a very big discussion where here, we always talk about it, you know? Um, where do you find your role is? It's more on the designer part or fabricator? Uh, definitely more of a designer, yeah. I mean, we work with fabricators. At the end of the day, um, the fabrication process has to be integrated in the design. I was bringing the example over, uh, we were having tea before the presentation, and um, you know, a lot of architects are saying, because they get clients, Brick architecture companies, obviously, they're a preferable choice for governments. So they go to them and they say, we want a 3D printed building. And they, the architects in Dubai would say, here's a design for a 3D printed building. But then the design has nothing to do with the technology. It's similar to doing this. It's similar to having a client saying, I want a timber structure building. And you give them a concrete structure building. You know, the design has, to the smallest detail, has to be thought out from the fabrication endpoint. It's a, it's a sort of feedback loop between you know, big ideas and then detail, big ideas and then detail, and then seeing how you can actually moderate towards something that would be the final outcome. So I would, no, I would not place us as fabricators, as much as like now we, get, we got a project, we got a sort of a small investment for the, the, the lighting product, the product line that we were developing, and we're developing that as a product that you can 
buying gift shops, uh, almost like a bespoke item. Um, but we don't really want to fabricate it, so I'm trying to find, I'm trying to outsource that process. Um, so we're definitely more on the design point, um, design side, but looking at what fabricators need to get the job done and pushing that as much as possible to get the best design. Um, any last question for tonight? I see a lot of questions here. <laughs> oh, but we're out of time. <laughs> yeah, I think we're almost out of time now. But uh, uh, usually, Mr. Vishal always has questions. <laughs> Anything to say? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right then. Well, uh, in that, in that. Okay then. I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so let's see. What's the? Um, can I see the next slide? I think I'm supposed to introduce you the uh, next um, next month presentation. Yeah. So uh, for. Design Lecture Series next one on the 12th of February. It's going to be by a couple from India um, under the studio of Brigitte. So uh, it's uh, it's by Shefali Dawani and Robert Brigitte. And I hope you guys can come over. And again, thank you so much for being here today, and especially our guests all the way from Dubai. Uh, thank you. Oh, one question. Just one last question. Uh, the 3D printing environment uh, at the moment, it has to be in a certain, in a clean environment. Is it? Or can it, instead of you fabricating off site, can you bring the robot instead on site and print it there? Not really, no. No? no, no, no. So the process of the, doing the material, getting yeah. the materials. Because it looks nice, right? <laughs> and our client wanted it. But what we can't be, really do that. Yeah, what would be cool is that if I just ask people to throw the, all the bottles into a, a container, container and then the container, container will automatically be filtered and then, yeah. you know, that would be cool. It's a very you nice see idea. See the whole process. Yeah. yeah. It's a very nice idea. Fortunately, at the moment, it's not doable. It's a very industrial process. What you're talking about. It actually it also has a lot of... Yeah, I mean, it has to be done in a factory. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.